These are the days when you just say, yeah, uh-oh. I mean, we've been we've been expecting this. We've seen it coming. But now that it's now that it's coming in, it's one of those things where you're just you don't really want to believe. You don't really want to think, yeah, here we go again. I mean, Maersk said it yesterday, as I mentioned in yesterday's video, when they said it appears to be prolonged. And by it appears to be prolonged, they mean the downturn. And the reason why it's being prolonged is because it's not getting better. The second he second half rebound, rather than rebounding, it's accelerating to the downside in some very crucial ways. The Chinese in particular just reported some truly alarming, ugly numbers and in key metrics as well. It's getting so bad that even places like Bloomberg are forced to report on deflation and recession, the potential for both that are no longer just potential. As I said, accelerating to the downside. Here's what Bloomberg said yesterday. When China abandoned pandemic restrictions after three years of stringent controls, Ni Xinquang was expecting booming sales for his handmade leather shoes. Instead, demand has been so poor that he's had to cut prices 3% from a year ago and reduce his profits. Ni said his Italy Alcina Group, which is based in eastern China's Wenzhou city, and caters to domestic retailers and consumers, has seen business tail off since February. Many of his clients are still scarred from the damage COVID did to their cash flow and profit. Some retailers, rather than putting in new orders, are trying to sell all the stock they've accumulated while expecting sales to surge. Because there it is. Once again, we see this fiction of a red hot economy. In the West, at least, we got the fantasy of consumer prices to help us pretend the economy was actually recovering. Whereas in China, the Chinese didn't even get that sort of fairy tale to paper over their economic condition. Instead, they continue to report numbers that are the worst we've seen since 2009. And not just the worst we've seen since 2009. More and more, they're starting to look like 2009. And it's having a number of impacts, not just in China, but around China. What we're talking about today is global trade, in particular, some really ugly numbers from China in terms of exports as well as imports, and some very big struggles and maybe a, a potentially important turn in China's yuan and the government's, uh, government's treatment and attempt to control the yuan. We're seeing some changes there as well. There is a lot of really ugly stuff here today. Again, not that we're surprised we've been expecting it, but as it comes in, it still makes you shake your head. First, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're interested, Eurodollar University has memberships and research subscriptions available. We're still, still running our sale on both of those. The memberships are exclusive content on the Eurodollar system, what it is, how it's supposed to work, why it may not be working the way we need it to, as well as research subscriptions. I do a daily briefing, which is a daily briefing of macroeconomic news, like we're going to go over today, as well as some market notes, like we're going to go over today. I also do a daily deep dive analysis where every day we dive deeper into these topics of money and macro, what's really happening, what's behind all of the news, why things are happening the way they're happening, all of the stuff, the what, the why, the background, the daily briefing, the daily deep dive analysis, and the memberships available for you at eurodollar.university. So the worse it gets for China's economy, that first of all means it's not good anywhere else, especially when we're talking about global trade. Demand for Chinese-made goods is falling as bad as Chinese-made goods are falling themselves because the global economy is experiencing more, more, more clearly the deflationary recession that markets have been telling us is coming all of this time. And it's creating any number of problems all throughout the system. We we'll start with China here because that's what we're talking about. But you have to wonder, I mean, why is it that despite everything that's supposedly against, for example, U.S. Treasuries or long-term government bonds anywhere around the world, why there's such demand for safety and liquidity? Specifically Treasuries, we've got 
quantitative tightening up to almost three quarters of a trillion just in U.S. Treasuries. We got the rate hikes from the Fed, threats for more rate hikes from the Fed. We had the Fitch downgrade. We've got the Treasury deluge, which is going on because Treasury can't raise enough taxes. And on top of everything, it's August, which is always a bad month for Treasuries. And yet, as I speak to you, the 10 year Treasury is down and hanging in around 4%, despite all of these Treasury negative factors. And you have to ask yourself, why? What is going on in the world that, re that the demand for safe and liquid instruments is un almost unshakable? And it's the same way in Europe. To ask the question is to answer it. Safety and liquidity are in demand because of everything that we've seen. And the opposite side of safety and liquidity is something like China's yuan. Because dollar providers who normally would want to provide dollars for Chinese companies to do all sorts of trade and financial, uh, financial projects around the world and internally in China, dollar providers are looking at the Chinese and saying, I'm not sure I want to provide dollars at the same, same terms I did before. Instead, I need a little bit more incentive, in this case, a lot more incentive, in order, in order, in, in, to get me to want to engage in these financing transactions. That causes, among other things, pullback in trade. It enhances the pullback in trade, as well as it causes China's yuan to decline. CNY goes down, which if you remember, CNY down equals bad is our basic euro dollar formula. But Chinese authorities have said, we don't want CNY to go down because that makes us look bad. It makes everybody look and highlight, it highlights the, the problems that are taking place in China, and it puts a spotlight on all of those at a particularly sensitive moment in their economic and political history. So ever since the end of June, China's authorities, the PBOC, has been trying to, trying to push CNY back higher. It started around June 26 when the People's Bank of China set their daily, uh, daily midpoint or their central parity stronger than the market. And the idea is when you do that, that what the PBOC is attempting to do is say, I'm going to set the, the, the midpoint up here. And if the market rate goes down too low, that's going to cause the PBOC to have to step in in the parlance of traders. They're going to have to sell dollars and buy yuan, which they're really doing is redistributing dollars into the system. But that threat alone is supposed to dissuade speculators and shorts on the currency and get the yuan stabilized. But instead, while it has, uh, it has slowed the fall of CNY to some extent, largely because commercial banks have been acting on those threats on behalf of the PBOC, but either way, China's yuan has hardly been stable. In fact, as I speak to you now, it's close to 722 to the dollar again, despite the, the PBOC fixing in recent weeks, 714, 713, 712 on some days, really trying to get the yuan to stabilize, if not go higher again. Instead, the yuan continues to want to fall in the face of these stronger fixes, as well as commercial banks redistributing dollars into the markets. And like we ask with treasures, you have to ask yourself, why? What is, what is it that keeps pushing, pushing CNY down? It's not speculators. It's the deflationary recession and dollar providers assessing a risk premium on China in order to provide those dollars. Now, we got today consist, uh, coincident and consistent with the export numbers from the General Administration of Customs. We got a little bit of a mystery because it was reported the PBOC fixed the central parity today at 713.65, but then CFET said it was 715.65, so it's not clear whether the PBOC revised its earlier fix or that was reported in error, but either way, it doesn't matter. At 715.65, that's the weakest central parity fix for the CNY currency by the PBOC since July 13. So as CNY gets weaker, as China's economy careens into the deflationary recession and it gets worse, accelerates to the downside, we see some more downside to China's currency. At the same time, perhaps we're seeing authorities maybe throw in the towel, giving up on its stronger fixes, realizing that the, the path of least resistance here is with the global deflationary recession and weaker CNY moving forward. 
which is not a good thing for anyone. Again, remember our formula here, C and Y down equals bad. Not just bad for China, but bad for the entire global economy because of what it represents. The same thing as the demand for safety and liquidity in the US treasuries. What did the Chinese actually report for their numbers? Oh boy. It, when you see these numbers, you understand exactly what's going on in the yuan, what's going on in U.S. treasuries and German bonds and around commodity prices that are suddenly getting weaker. Uh, China's Shanghai Steel, which is now the lowest it's been since early June, heading lower. And a number of indications, especially macro sensitive indications where the macro environment, like the money environment, is becoming worse and worse all the time. As Bloomberg, I mentioned the Bloomberg article, they were actually previewing to an extent the numbers we got from China. They said, unlike the temporary decline in late 2020 and early 2021, the drop in consumer prices this time around in 2023 is more cause for concern. Back then, falling pork prices were the main reason. Now, exports have plunged as consumers in some of China's biggest markets, including the US and Europe, pull back on spending. China tells us something crucial about the US, Europe, Japan, Asia, emerging markets. When we get on the, on the import side, all of it, the Chinese economy is at the center of the global system. And it's a, an extremely important bellwether. And that bellwether has been ringing the bell on deflationary recession for some time. And now the numbers are just, they're just proving it. Exports in the month of July fell 14.5% year over year. That's including prices, but still 14.5%. That's, that's worse than the 12.4% year over year in the month of June. 14.5%, that's the worst this cycle. Um, to give you an idea of what that means, outside of February 2020, that would have been the second worst month in 2020 for Chinese exports. That's that's equivalent to early 2016, when much of the global global economy was experiencing a monstrous recession, if not depression in some places. Global trade, first of all. That's, that's like January 2009. That's how bad that export figure is. And that's July 2023, when the second half of this year was supposed to be the rebound. And here we have China saying, we're not seeing it from our biggest customers. Exports to their biggest customers, which happened to be the U.S., Europe, and across Asia, were all down by 20 plus percent. Exports to its biggest customers all down by 20 plus percent. To the U.S., exports were down 23.1 percent year over year in July. To the ASEAN countries, 21.4 percent year over year. And to Europe, 20.6 percent year over year, which is an acceleration to the downside to the European customers. For much of the rest of the global economy, it's the imports into China. So not only does China have this external problem where the global trade recession is really starting to hamper economic activity, China, of course, also has its internal problems that were not really ever about zero COVID and pandemic politics. Yes, those made it worse, but the Chinese economy has been in very rough shape for several years, many years, going back to really 2011 and 2012, where in the absence of the global euro dollar system, the globalization period up until 2008, China is just not the same China. And Chinese authorities realize that they cannot just simply stimulate needlessly or stimulate mindlessly, needlessly too, without it causing major problems, without that external boost from an economy that looked like the pre-2008 economy, it just leaves the, it leaves them in the shape that the, the, it leaves them to consider whether or not they're following the Japanese in the 1980s, which is a worst case for a top heavy political structure like China's. So external problems, internal problems, import problems. Imports fell 12.4% year over year in the month of July. That's much worse than the 6.8% in June. For crude oil, the Saudi Arabians, Saudis Arabians, I always get this wrong. The Saudi Arabians or the Saudis, OPEC, OPEC is going to have to cut more oil production because according to China's General Administration of Customs, weak demand for oil, 
which is why, why they've been cutting production thus far this year, confirming not just the weak demand across the global economy, but more importantly, it's not picking up in the second half of the year. And if anything, we're moving, accelerating to the downside. The rest of China's imports, imports from Japan at minus 14.7% was actually a bright spot, believe it or not. Minus 14.7% is obviously a bad number. Imports from the rest of the ASEAN countries, minus 11.2%, accelerating to the downside. From South Korea, shout out to Mr. Stephen Van Meter, who pays attention to South Korea as another bellwether. Imports from South Korea into China, minus 23% year over year. Just 2009 like numbers and one other thing and one other note here chinese imports from russia are actually down for the first time since february 2021 down eight percent in u.s dollar terms because even though they want to help out the russians in every single way to get cheap oil energy and everything else with crude oil imports down overall that also means crude oil imports from the russian partners the Chinese economy, like its currency, is heading into truly dangerous territory. And the reason it's heading into truly dangerous territory is the very reasons we've been expecting all along. Except now we're beginning to see it more clearly. And though you might be sitting outside of China and thinking, what does this have to do with us? It has everything to do with the rest of the global economy, including directly lack of demand from the United States and Europe, but more, in, more, more comprehensively globally synchronized deflationary recession. The term globally synchronized is a somewhat misleading because it's not exactly synchronized in time, though just give it some time and it will. If you want to see more about globally synchronized and what that means and how it gets to be that way, check out the video at the link below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you to Eurodollar University subscribers and thank you to our Eurodollar University members. And until next time, take care.